guys came here, we out there, let me know. Uh, we have many important community reports. Hearing and seeing them. No public hearings. Town administrator report. Yes. They're going to have to be out too. Okay. Um, we have officially set the tax rate. It has dropped 79 cents from $11.40 to $10.61. Um, our average tax bill is only increasing 0.67%. So that is official. It has been set and uh, certified by the Department of Revenue. Uh, the Larkin Mill dish ladder is probably two days away from being complete. The DPW has um, performed the work themselves. We've been in contact with Ben Hagen um, throughout um, the work. But we need a couple more. The snow slowed us down, so we need about two more days to get that done. Um, let's see, DPW has also completed an inventory of all the catch basins in town, so we now have that uh, formally. Also, Bernie Field, Brian Lamara, and James Surrett have all attained their commercial applicators' licenses, and we're not going to be able to um, run the Central Street. Uh, field fertilization program, the playing field fertilization program in house. We're not going to need to contract that out any longer. Yep. Um, at our recent managers meeting, uh, James Surrett also noted to us that with the paving of Old Rowley Road, which was recently completed, we, the town no longer has any more dirt roads. So, progress. The, uh, Congressman Seth Holden will be holding a Congress in your corner event at the Bifed Library on December 12th at 1.15 p.m. for anyone that's interested in attending that. The phone system which we received funding for at the special town meetings of the Council on Aging has been implemented and has improved significantly with that system. I also wanted to notify you that um, we're going to have some office hour changes in the month of December. On the 22nd, we'll be closing at noon to hold our annual holiday party, which will be at the Byfield Library this year. On 12-26 and, and uh, January 2nd, the offices will be um, closed to observe the holidays. And that's it. Great. Thank you for your under new business, tonight we have an emergency vehicle response and, and fire apparatus fleet evaluation. And Nathan, do you want to uh, introduce the guys? Yep, we, uh, tonight we have uh, uh, Mike Wilbur and Keith Purdy here. Uh, we had the opportunity to have uh, these fellows come down and spend some time with us. Uh, they evaluated all of our apparatus. Uh, they spent time under uh, all the apparatus. These guys uh, all over the country and Europe. Uh, evaluating apparatus, uh, their towns, the way the town is laid out, um, to come to towns and help them and tell them what they're going to need for replacement apparatus in the future, what type of apparatus best suits their town. Um, it was an unbelievable learning experience. Um, it's a heck of a report that these guys put together. Um, they're here to present it to us tonight. And uh, I hope we can use it as a guideline and a map for how we work for the future of our replacement and the type of apparatus we're going to need for the town. Uh, the report that we're referencing looks like this, about 55 pages. Um, I believe it's been set electronically. Most folks have it. We're not going to go through it line by line because we'd be here until around 2 in the morning. And I really don't want to do that to you. I could do it. Probably. We have a summary that we're going to do on the board. I apologize in advance. I walk around a lot and I can go for hours. So if I've covered a subject and beaten it down to the point you don't want to hear anymore, tell me to move on and I will gladly move on. Yes, I'm done with the introduction, so I will move on with that. What we do, we go around the world, we check folks, we, under, we look at fire service organizations, we call them FSOs. We're studying your apparatus, we are studying your equipment, we're studying your topography, the environment, the exposure to risk. Do you have congested areas? Do you have homes that are set back away from the road? Do you have water supply issues? Or do you have abundant water supply? What are your call volumes? What are you actually responding to? Is most of your work EMS or about half of your work EMS or is it all firefighting? We basically create a profile of what the fire service organization and those services are dealing with. We 
we look at NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, are you in compliance, are your vehicles in compliance, are your equipment in compliance, your training, your maintenance, your replacement. The three last things I mentioned are important. Your training, your maintenance, and your replacement. That's a lot of what we're going to talk about in this report. Having the rigs that are painted red and the emergency EMS stuff that's painted white is nice, but we look at how do you maintain it, how do we keep it at top level performance. We look at the staff, we look at the training, we look at the training regimen that's in place. We study your culture and history. You didn't get here overnight. One of the things that Mr. Wilbur, who owns our company, likes to say, you didn't create this in a day. We are not going to change your direction in a day. So this is a map, this is a plan, this is a way to get you to where you need to be. As Mike will say, it's a living document. What this is meant to do is give you a guide give you a position to move forward and take the steps necessary to get to the trajectory you want to get to. Not all of these steps are painless. And I brought this up last night. And for those of you that are in the room that are non-fire people, fire people are different. We, we can't help it. It's just the way we are in the program this way. Fire people emotionally attach themselves to their fire trucks. They just do. It is a strange, bizarre behavior Norman Rockwell, the painter, picked up on this. He made a beautiful painting once that said, hooray, the new American LaFrance is here. He did not make a painting ever that said, hooray, the new ambulance is here. No offense to you, you must be. Never, never did it. Fire trucks stir an emotional reaction. We are fire truck people. We are also ambulance people. We write reports about fire trucks. Not all of our reports are great and glowing. Sometimes when we write, things need to change. Sometimes we take a vehicle that you're emotionally tied to and we say, we're sorry that you're in love with this vehicle, but it's beyond its service life and it needs to go away. We are not trying to hurt your feelings. We are not trying to make anyone feel emotionally bad or not want to volunteer or anything like that. It's not what we're about. Firefighters also like to pack everything they own onto every truck, just in case. I need to have seven toolboxes at the scene, just in case. We talk about rationalizing your equipment. So some of the things I'll talk about very briefly in this report, these are suggestions to get you where you need to be from an outsider's point of view. We don't know who hand-built some of the stuff. I'm not aware of who actually put some of the equipment mounting together. It all looks great. I'm not arguing about it, but we talk about safety and the culture of safety. So as I talk about that, I am not interested in offending anyone. Don't know many of your last names. Don't know who's family and who's not family, thankfully for me. I get to go home far, far away, so if I do make you angry, you can't find me. It's not easy. So I will go through the report and show you what we've got. We are also a bit cynical, so I apologize for that. We're looking to create safe vehicles. We're interested in creating a culture of safety. It is hazardous work. We can't take that away. Some people confuse the word hazardous with heroic. It's different. It's very different. Hazardous work is when you least expect that someone driving 65 miles an hour in a 30 zone as you're standing out in the street trying to direct traffic is going to see you as nothing more than a human pine line, and they're going to kill you. That happened. How many times in the last couple of months has it happened somewhere in the United States? We had a couple of us. A couple of people have. So we try to create safe culture. When we're looking at the vehicles, we're trying to make the vehicle as safe as possible. We're looking at the age. We're looking at its condition. Its condition is what is the environment doing to it? What is the corrosion? What are the salt spray doing underneath the vehicle? Is it rotting? What's the condition of the components, the valves, the metals, the material, the paint, the hose, the connection, everything? What's going on with this product? We look at the equipment that you're carrying. Is it the right equipment for you? Is it what you're supposed to have? We check the weight of the apparatus. Some fire departments, maybe not yours, but in other places we've been around the United States, believe that there are fire trucks that are exempt from weight loss. It's okay to believe that until you're in a motor vehicle accident. Then you find out quite quickly you're not exempt from DOT law, from FMDSS, from any standard that's in the highway. So many of our recommendations that are in here, when we ask you about weight or we ask you about your tires, we're not saying it because it's our opinion. We're telling it to you because it's the law. And we're just bringing it up. You can choose to ignore it, you can suggest you don't, which we talked about before the meeting. But we want you to take a lot of this seriously because it's for the safety of the operating folks and the public around this machine when it's working. We talk about prep, proper maintenance. What are you doing to keep the vehicles up and running? NFPA compliance and having a proper replacement schedule to keep up-to-date vehicles, contemporary vehicles in the fleet. Start with engine one. And again, there's more detail in this report. This is just a summary so that we can uh, provide this information and transfer it quite quickly. Engine one is relatively new. 
we have some corrosion issues, the equipment and some of the things that are carried in it, and this is going to either fall under maintenance or equipment. One of the things that Tom Chan and Mike Wilbur and I like to look at when we're evaluating the fleet is all the equipment mounted and able to withstand the 9G force, which is written in NFPA 1901. Folks not familiar with the standards, NFPA puts out standards for fire apparatus. The standard looks like this. It's available to any of you if you ever want to buy it. And if you think the report is fun reading, memorize this. This is the standard to which we judge fire trucks. So if it's in the report, that's what we're looking at. One of the things that we're trying to do is create standards for equipment mounting so that everything is mounted where it needs to be and everything is locked down for a transit when it's moving down the road. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm talking quickly and I apologize. Plus, I have some allergies, so as I'm slurring, um, I actually had seltzer water tonight, not alcohol, so my voice is just because of my allergies. Proper maintenance is critical. The weight of the apparatus is critical. The engine one, we're good for weight. Uh, proper maintenance, we're going to talk about at the end, and it's NFPA compliant fleet. What is engine one? Would you like the visual? I can show no, you a picture. No, just kind of tell us. Okay. Is it, I'll, is it a pumper or a pumper? Yes, an engine pumper. is a pumper. Yep. Engine one, you want to talk about engine one, or you want me to talk about engine one? Because I, I have pictures of all the trucks as well. Just kind of tell, because a lot of people are not aware. Just let us know what it is. Okay. Well, let me do this. If you don't mind, I'm going to do two things at once if that's okay. Bear with me. First new engine by field station. Let me make a look through. I'm sorry, without my reading glasses, I'm not allowed to find it. Okay, here's a picture of your engine one. What we're looking at is a Ferrara fire apparatus back end with an HME chassis. That's the front end, the cap, the chassis, the front end, the rear end, together by some company called HME. This is running the by field as their primary engine coming out the door. This is referred to, and I, I, again, for you non fire people, I'm not trying to get techie or whatever, but. This is referred to as a top mount style pumper, meaning the control station to operate, the pump operator is actually standing off the road and stands up in this location here. Our pump's located here, and this has conventional style doors. So this is the truck we're talking about. It is a newer vehicle. It is showing a little bit of corrosion for its age as part of the review. However, it's relatively compliant. Most everything on it's buttoned up. That's why it doesn't have a lot of cautionary notes around it in my color code. Right. So, to go back to the color coding for a second, green means it's good to go, red is a warning symbol, and yellow is... Yellow means it's something we'll talk about at the end of the presentation. So we have a cautionary note, and it's something we'll talk about. Okay. Next up is engine three. Since I know this question is coming right now, I'm going to go grab a picture of engine three real quick. Also in the Byfield station, first due to all MBAs, top mounts uh, because that keeps the guys off the highway. They like to be up above the on the highway. Here it is. <coughs> engine three. Just as we were saying, it's a little bit older. And so as I go into the review and the color coding of engine three, it comes up a little bit different based on what we're doing. Tell us the year of the up press. Some corrosion issues going on in the truck. 
bit of a red flag for us. The equipment, because of its age, some of the stuff is very a bit older. It is underweight where it needs to be, operationally speaking, to go out on the road, so it's okay to approve for that. May use it will be something we'll talk about at the end for all of the fleet. It is NFPA compliant at the time it was built. I'm going to speak to that real quick about what that means. NFPA updates their standard every few years, and what happens is an NFPA compliant vehicle, vehicle being sold, must be compliant at the time of its manufacture. So if you rebuild a vehicle, it may actually still follow the standard from which it was originally manufactured. So even though I have a green tag there, that is because it's compliant to the date it was manufactured, not that it's compliant to the standard that exists today. The new standard is 2025. To that point, if you are a civilian and you may go to the firehouse here or the one in the fire station in Byfield and the doors are open in the summertime and you look in as a taxpayer and you say, wow, that looks all shiny, red, and new. Why does the fire department need another truck? Fire trucks generally have a life cycle of 20 years, 15 years in frontline service and five years in some kind of reserve status. The technolo technology has overtaken all of us. There are some with some white hair and snow on the roof like me uh, that remember rotary phones with party lines. There were three on, on ours. Uh, well, thank God for technology, otherwise we'd still have rotary phones with party lines. Uh, and so technology has uh, crept in to fire apparatus building and fire apparatus maintenance just like in any discipline here in this country in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, what would have been intrinsically safe back in 1990 when it was built today due to the safety advancements, uh, rollover protection, enhanced seat belts, frontal airbags and fire trucks, uh, vehicles that were built in 1990 are basically unsafe today. And so you may go past the fire station and look at something red, shiny and new, but it is not indicative of what really is going on within the fire department or what the fire department needs at this present time. The second thing is cost. Whether you like it or not, uh, the current president, who's uh, due to step out of office next month, uh, was responsible for adding about $65,000 to the cost of a piece of fire apparatus. He and he alone, along with the EPA, decided that the diesel engines that we were using uh, were not good enough and were not clean enough, and so he took on the whole heavy-duty truck industry and basically had the truck industry redesign diesel engines to a higher emission standard. And of course, I, for one, don't like following a diesel truck emitting black, yucky exhaust like anybody else. But for the fire apparatus industry, it was a tremendous amount of overkill that increased the cost to taxpayers across this country in basically an unfunded mandate and unfairly. Uh, the reality is, is that the fire truck that you bought 10 years ago cost $63,000 more today because the cabs had to be completely redesigned to accommodate the new engines, which were more money because of EPA regulations. That's not fire truck manufacturers or salespeople getting greedy and earning a lot of money. That was a $63,000, $65,000 pass along uh, that came to you based on the new standard. So want to make that perfectly clear. People look at the cost of fire trucks and how come they're so expensive. Um, much of it, particularly lately, is due to federal mandate and government intervention that was unfunded. Uh, the fire service tried to get exempt from that on several different, um, several different uh, steps along the way, and there were no exemptions granted. They had to follow the same thing as a heavy-duty truck market. This is engine nine. Next up for review, this is sitting here. It's 1995. And engine nine is a vehicle that is a little bit more. Engine nine is showing us some signs of its age and some issues. 
I'm denying that the ion that's kind of being sort of slick but it's bumping up against the edge of that pipe. It has quite a bit of corrosion and contamination underneath it, and being at the end of its service life, that's to be expected. Some of the equipment is out of date. And the killer, if there is, I can use that word, it seems a bit strong. The killer issue on this vehicle is that with the seating arrangement that's in the cab and with the weight rating that is stickered on the vehicle, which cannot be changed, that weight rating is what it is. If everyone is riding in that cab, the vehicle's overweight. I mean, that, that can't happen going up and down the road. That's not something that we, as emergency vehicle response, um, advise customers to do even in the interim. So there is, in our report, a request that not all seating positions be filled whenever the truck goes out on the road because potential could be overweight on the front axle. If there's a motor vehicle accident, this is a public record document that indicates we know we have an unsafe condition. And that is simple math. It's actually coming off of the uh, weighted vehicle and the sticker that is in there for out of the VSS. Maintenance on this truck because of its age it has tires that are overdue for replacement. That is a second sticking item. Uh, when tires go beyond their service life for a fire apparatus which is seven years, they are to be replaced. Whether the tread looks good or doesn't look good, this is an issue with dry rot. This is not an issue with your personal vehicle or something you're running for 10 or 15,000 miles a year. Fire trucks don't run very often. The issue we have with truck tires on fire apparatus throughout North America is that the vehicle does not get a chance to run those tires and they're suffered. They can suffer premature wear on the inside. Michelin and Goodyear both have published documents on this that are available at their website. They list both recreational vehicle tires as seven-year replacement tires and fire apparatus vocational loaded tires as seven-year replacements. How, how important is it uh, this past July in three separate accidents, four firefighters were killed uh, when there was a tire failure on the apparatus. So uh, as we head into Christmas in a couple weeks, uh, there are four families out there that are not going to have their brothers, uh, fathers, uh, husbands, and sons uh, at, around a Christmas tree this year because of tire failures. So it's critically important uh, that any tires that we've identified in our report that need replacing get replaced now. Serious as the last report was. This is the newest member of the fleet. This is the new KME. Um, it has been here for a very short period of time. It would be incredibly unfair to start criticizing and ripping the brand new vehicle apart. Unfortunately, we don't have much here to rip apart. So, it, it, from a color coding standpoint, from a quick evaluation review standpoint, we are in very, very good shape here um, because the vehicle is new. And given that, Everything seems to be where it is, except for our cautionary tale. There are, are a few routine maintenance items and corrosion issues that we see even on a brand new truck underneath them. We have a little bit of frame corrosion that is coming out already. And part of what we'll discuss at the end, which is why every truck has for the maintenance either a yellow tab or a red tab, we really want to impress upon you the maintenance that is required to keep the fleet at a state of readiness that you should expect. And that'll be apparent at the end of this. Being it was a vehicle that we folks that don't have too many issues at all, which we would expect for a vehicle at this stage. Any questions so far? Excuse me? Yes, we have a question. What were you saying? Yes. Can you remind me what the um, age of engine 9 was, please? Engine 9, I believe, I'll have to go back and look at it. It was 1994? 1995. It is a uh, Spartan Motors chassis, a Salisbury Fire Rescue body, and an LTI 75-foot ladder. Mike, do you want to say something, or are you just stretching your arm? Well, it's, it's oh, you're stretching it. Yeah, no. Didn't know the okay. Crank it up.
later one is at the end of its service life in terms of age. It's showing some corrosion, but for its age, it's not too bad. Um, it's what we would expect to find with a vehicle this vintage. The equipment that's carried is, is relevant for the age of the vehicle. This truck also has an overweight condition. If all seats are filled in the cab, the truck is overweight on the front end. And, and this is problematic of, of aerial trucks. Aerial vehicles for fire service use are typically right at their axle load limits. This is a truck that has additional seats mounted in the cab, which was, was designed to do with the previous owner, the original owner. This is a vehicle that was purchased, used, to be used here. Um, with their original owner, uh, it, it was kind of over-designed, and um, they put in a design defect that you inherited when you bought it. It's nothing you did arrive with. But we put that cautionary statement out there. It also has a red flag because aerial trucks are a bit different than your ordinary pumpers. Um, the aerial should be tested every year. We should have a third party testing certificate. Aerial trucks should be stickered every year. At the time that this evaluation was done, that test certificate had not been done, it had not been put in place. We present that because having that third party testing is very, very important for a device that goes up in the air. An aerial failure is catastrophic. There are no minor aerial failures on the fire ground. They're catastrophic events. In some departments, fire service organizations, they're listed as criminal events because they're not designed to do that. So we try to prohibit failure by testing, certification, and inspection. If we find a fire department that hasn't been doing that annual test, we bring it up and flag it because, first of all, the test is not cheap, and, and I should comment, we do not provide that aerial service. We are not actually seeking that business from you or trying to sell it or, or sit a scare tactic get you to buy it. We're not selling that, but what we're suggesting is it's so important to anyone maintaining a fleet that if you're not doing it, we want to bring it to your attention because it's one of the critical things you do if you own a ladder truck. In your case, you have two, and they have to be tested. And I believe it's 10000 a year, something like that. Are you tested? Yeah, tested. Now, the test is like $1,000, but with all the testing we, we go on. We talk the about the cost of ownership of each truck. In the engines, the average cost of ownership per year should average out about five to eight thousand dollars per year. That's what it costs to own a pump. That's insurance, that's testing, that's putting tires on it in seven years, that's preventive maintenance, that's pump testing, hose testing. All the things that go on with that truck, if you average it out over its service life, should be between five and eight thousand dollars a year. When we come in and ask for your maintenance records, and we look at a pumper that's costing fifteen thousand dollars a year for the last three years, or forty-five thousand dollars, what does that tell us? That may be a truck that it's time to cycle out of the fleet because it's eating you out of house and home. When do you go buy a new car? when the old car is starting to show up at the mechanic's lot early and often and then you cycle it out and you get a new car or a newer used car because you can't really afford to have breakdowns. And in our line of work here as the fire department, as the citizens, you are expecting us to show up 100% of the time in time to, to help you through whatever emergency uh, that you have. And we can't do that if we're worried about the truck breaking down. So that's the cost of ownership for an engine. For the ladders that you have, like that one, the cost of ownership is between eight and twelve thousand dollars a year. Aerial devices, because of the testing, because of the hydraulic system, because of the intricacies of the vehicle, cost more to own and maintain than a straight pumper. And again, if we're looking at maintenance records when we come in and evaluate your fleet, we want all the maintenance records. And when we see maintenance records on a ladder that again are fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a year for three or four years running, uh, that sends us to go to great pause and investigate further, and that may be time to cycle that unit out of the fleet. And that's regardless of age, or miles, or how shiny it looks, or anything else. Um, we have gone to places, and the fire department wants to replace the oldest vehicle. Um, the reality is the older vehicle wasn't nearly as bad as the newer vehicle. And so as part of one of our recommendations, it's to cycle the newer vehicle out of the fleet because it's just a disaster. And so what, I guess, the cautionary tale here is that what it appears to be on the outside 
isn't indicative of what it's costing uh, the fire department or the taxpayers to, to keep it on the road and what's actually going on underneath the hood or underneath the bottom. Next up we have Ladder 3. Ladder 3 was actually built in the model year 2000. You have had it since 2014. Part of this use. Um, it is still listed as part of our vehicles in 2000 because that was the year it was built, so that's what we're using as the baseline here. This vehicle is uh, located at the station that we are presently sitting at. Again, the flag that we have attached to this goes to the ladder testing, which Mike just spoke about. It's not showing the corrosion that the other vehicle is. It's not showing the weight restriction that the other vehicle is. Um, so by nature of the two aerials put together, this is less risk than the other one, which is just based on two aerials that happen to be roughly the same size for their aerial extension. But from a service capability standpoint, one is slightly better than the other. This is not meant to sound cynical. So if you are a firefighter right now, you will understand what I'm saying. If you're with the public, I am not criticizing your fire department. That's not what this is. There is a standard for automotive fire apparatus that are used in wildland firefighting operation. Your truck was not in school that day that they taught us. It does not follow the standard at all. In fact, this truck is the antithesis of the standard. It is just not client. When we did the evaluation, it is noted in here briefly. And the reason it's noted so briefly is there was no reason to, 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 to beat down the subject four or five different ways. Because it is a non-standard vehicle, we simply call it a, it's referred to as a specially built vehicle. It doesn't meet. We can't qualify it or disqualify it. It doesn't even come close. So there, and, and again, this was kind of a home-built truck. It was done by members of the organization. It was coordinated by this organization with the right intentions. Do it for cheap, do it right, do it the way we need it, do it because we have a need to fill and this is the way that I think it went down. I was not here, but I'm, I'm guessing because I can see the evolution of this. So as we're doing this evaluation, we're not trying to insult anyone that participated in this and we're not trying to take it away from the group that's running this. I don't need a show of hands, but there are firefighters in the organization that emotionally are tied to this vehicle. And, and I can tell by some of the tears that they're in the room. We're not judging that. What we're simply saying is that for us, when we're doing an evaluation, it either meets a standard or it doesn't meet a standard. If it doesn't meet a standard, we give you the line items why. If it's so far away that we can't even judge it against the standard, it's, it's a non-starter. It, it gets on the replacement list simply because we don't have anything to work with. We couldn't put enough money into this to get it to meet the safety standards of the NFPA. We can't get there from here. Period. Therefore, we cannot make a recommendation to even touch it. It's 
much more of budget plain as a rule. And this is something that will eventually be replaced by something that is much closer to the standard. And that's all we can recommend. I think I did that without hurting. <laughs> I heard someone last night, actually, that's why I'm being so careful today. And as you can see, when you get this many red flags, you are probably not going to move forward. And this is just the case. The only reason the condition or corrosion doesn't have a red tab is the entire body is made of aluminum tread plate. And in theory, the aluminum tread plate will not rust. It, it will exfoliate. So, Given that, I, I can't give that a red flag just by nature of what it is. The green for the replacement schedule is we've created such a wonderful replacement schedule that the only thing it has going for it is we know that you'll get to actually offer it for sale to someone. So we have that to look forward to as well. I'm going to... Um, show the picture of Forestry 2 next, but if anybody didn't care much for Forestry 1, but this tied to Forestry 2, just so you know it's coming, the exact same story applies to Forestry number 2. It, it just doesn't have a trip plate body. The same rules apply. So both of the forestry units which are intended for a very specific role within your fire service organization, both of those have deviated so far from the standard that we can't acknowledge them as even being an attempt to meet the standard. Um, and as I say this to you, all humor aside, this is not unique to you. This is not a defect that you, you have to be upset about. This is pretty common in the fire truck world. Pumpers go, in theory, in, in the eyes of the fire department, the pumper is the bread and butter vehicle that was the majority of the call. Much like in the EMS service, the ambulance is the expected vehicle that's going to the majority of the calls. The aerial is a special use vehicle. It is a very specific device designed to do very specific things in terms of fire department operations. For whatever reason in our world, forestry units, brush firefighting equipment is always on the back burner. The theory always is that a brush truck is just a disposable piece of equipment that we park in the back of the station until we need it. It is a false belief. It, it, it is not something that we promote because getting hurt, whether you get hurt where people can see you by the road or get hurt in the building where they can get you or get hurt four or five acres back in the woods, getting hurt is getting hurt. It doesn't matter where it happens. So we treat it with the same safety standard. Given that, this is actually a serious issue. I make light of it because you're so far away from the standard. However, the serious side of this, this, this is dangerous. This is worth noting, which is why it's got all the color coding attached. I'll actually go back and show you that picture in a second. We're in a good place to finish. Let me finish up this PowerPoint and we'll open up the questions and I'll show you a picture of that last thing. So our criteria when we're looking at a vehicle and when we actually ask somebody to take something out of service, we are following criteria that we're establishing. We document. When we ask you for your documents, we're trying to see what you do. We're trying to see what you have done. We're trying to see what happens. And again, in no way is this presentation trying to sell you on fear. I, I, I don't get paid to sell fear. That's, that's not what we're about. However, everything is fine until someone gets hurt. This equipment is rather unique. Whereas in your car, your personal vehicle, any recreational vehicles you own, you run them, you touch them, you actually are in them quite frequently. Fire truck's a little bit different. When everyone comes to that emergency vehicle and they climb in it, it may not have been running for quite a while. It may not have been out and been tested for quite a while. It's expected to perform immediately as its specified application. No brakes, no leaks, nothing failing. So when we're evaluating, we have to make sure that all the components we're looking at actually meet that. People sometimes dismiss us because we get obsessed, and, and the joke when we were in Coldwater, Michigan, was, do you guys work for TireRack.com? Because all you're talking about is tires. And then we provide the stats. Eight to 10 people a year are dying because of blown out tires on fire trucks. That's not funny. That's stupid. That's something we can control. Take it seriously. If we look at our tires, then it's not, you don't need, us to look at them, when you look at a tire, if it's cracked and if it's showing any signs of age or wear or if it's over at surface life, it gets to go away. There's a lot of people that fly airplanes that kind of rely on the same technology. If the tires are bad, please take them off. They're awfully hard to change in the sky when they start burning. That's a bad idea. Fire trucks apply the same way. When it goes, there isn't time to stop and ask for another. 
We look at the service life of the NFPA, what they're looking for. That is an established written standard. Um, some folks extend that a little bit for, for various reasons. Sometimes you have a vehicle you don't use very much, but you take good care of it and want to extend that service life. We understand that. We look and we note that. If you're at that service life window, if you're at the end of the service life, we want to put it in the replacement program and have a replacement schedule because it makes sense for you to pre-plan, put your money aside to be prepared to make that investment. Also, if we have something that is overweight, typically we can't fix an overweight vehicle. We've heard every excuse in the world. We've heard everything. I can put bigger springs on. I have a buddy who works at the tire store and they can respring it. I know a person who works at, at the fire truck manufacturing location. They can send us a new sticker. Why, why, why? Overweight is, is something that has to be dealt with very seriously. Typically, if you can't remove humans or remove equipment to get to that registered weight you're supposed to be at, don't do it. In New York, where I live, if we have a motor vehicle accident with a fire truck, the first thing they look at is the certified weight scale report. It has to be current. And if you violate it and you're overweight, all bets are off. Pre-existing condition, you lose. You lose. doesn't matter if you had the right weight or not. You lost. Go ahead. To give you an idea, we, we pull over under and through somewhere between three and 500 trucks a year now uh, doing fleet evaluations. And it's pretty scary what we're finding. Over 25% more fire trucks in this country are overweight right now, sitting in stations throughout the country. That, that's what our statistical analysis has found. And it's not just about being overweight. And then we start looking at the repair bills. Oh, it's going through breaks every nine months. It's breaking springs once a year. Those are all symptoms of the serious problem, which is the overweight truck. Like Keith said, if the truck is new enough, there is a potential to re it. Uh, we tried to do that with the truck. The reality is, is that the manufacturer that manufactured the chassis wouldn't re it and wouldn't recertify it. And so they ended up having to go out and buy a new truck anyway. Um, so re on the truck, we have come to find out, really isn't uh, on the list to do. Uh, many times the trucks are so overweight that if you take equipment off of them, uh, you, you are uh, making them inept for fire service use, or if you take water off of them. Uh, one of the things that as you go forward and you're going to buy new trucks, um, you need one of our rules when we get involved in helping departments purchase new trucks, you weigh before you pay. We are finding fire trucks that are being built right now that are being delivered to fire departments across the country that are overweight before they ever get to the firehouse to build that way. When we work on a set of specifications, we require the successful bidder that you could potentially go to contract with to have a weight analysis of that vehicle. One of my finest moments in doing this was a small department near me that took delivery of a combination, mini pumper, brush truck, first responder doing EMS runs. The chassis gross vehicle weight rating was 19.5 when it left the factory. According to their own records, it weighed 19.9 without water, people, or equipment on it. This truck had all of the makings of being over 3,800 pounds overweight on the axles when the fire department put it in service. I engaged a friend of mine that's a fire district attorney between the two of us 62 days after they took delivery of that truck. The company that built it took it back and we got the money back. That is on purpose, ladies and gentlemen, to get a municipality the money back on a poor fire truck. But we did that. I'm very proud of that, that we were able to fight the fight. And so, as you read the report, as you start to take this blueprint for success and enact some of the purchasing uh, steps that we've outlined, uh, you need to be very, very careful of what you buy and who you buy it from. It is a buyer beware. Not all fire trucks are created equal, not all salespeople are created equal. Um, you want to be very, very vigilant as to, and, and one, of the, one of our rules right now is you wait before you pay. You are not going to, if we're involved in you, or even for yourself now, if you don't do anything else after tonight, if you get a new fire truck in here, 
and load it up with equipment and water the way it's going to get on the road, and you weigh it before you pay anybody for anything. And if it is one ounce overweight of what it's supposed to be, then you're not going to pay. It's that simple. We're going to go into the replacement schedule, which is at the end of the report back that I neglected when we did the forestry trucks. The first forestry truck was in 1979, so many things, many years in the truck. And the second forestry truck was in 1990. Both of those were on the older side of the so, All right, as we go into the replacement uh, plan trajectory, the idea of the roadmap to get you to where you need to be. We have this little disclaimer, and I'm going to present this disclaimer for a very specific reason. We do not sell fire trucks. So as you are about to see some visuals and we're going to talk about fire trucks and we talk about safety and the things that we are suggesting, we do not have a financial interest in this conversation. We do the report. What you buy is your business. Who you buy it from is your business. We are not making recommendations. We are not endorsing anything. We are not suggesting anything. We're simply going to show you what we think is supposed to happen to get you in a healthy place. In the plan as it was written, this vehicle is to be retired in 2016, which I believe is about three weeks left to take care of that. The report was written a while ago. Um, I left it in this 2016 because that was what was in the original report. Obviously, you'd probably be looking for like 2017 to kind of put this plan in place. Let, let me speak to that. I certainly. While you do that, I'm going to go get water, so speak really slowly because I'll be right back. All right, I'll do these signs Thank or something. It is extremely important that the report as written and the replacement schedule that is in the report needs to be funded and started now. There is no free lunch here. You need to start spending 20, 16, and 17 dollars because it's a lot cheaper, thank you, than it would be to spend 20, 20, or 20, 21 dollars. This should have been down the road in three weeks. We're not going to make that. But this isn't something that you let linger and think that, like, you're, you're going to get a free pass here and you don't need to expend this money. This needs to be properly funded for the duration of the plan right now, right away. How you do it, where it comes from, is not up to us. But you, if you want to have a viable fire department with viable fire trucks show up at your particular homes and dwellings and businesses in this community, then this needs to be done. There are no alternatives. There have been a number of stopgap measures over time, like buying used equipment. This is a used truck. This was not yours. You bought it from somewhere else. The road to failure is often paved with good intentions. Nobody maliciously started buying used trucks for both departments, thinking that this would end up in less than an ideal spot. But right now, based on your fleet, based on what we find, based where you are, you're not in an ideal spot. Delaying implementation of what he's about to go over in any fashion is only going to hinder the end result and could end up getting you into a worse place than you already are now. So the 2017 replacement plan is to replace engine three. We've just shown the other engine is going to go away. This is a truck that will be replaced with new. This is appearing, for those that have read the report, I'm on page 53 under section 8.5 of the report. And I'm just showing you the visuals now of what vehicles are on the plan and what year it was written. I'm only taking you to the first couple of years of this. The complete trajectory is written in here and it takes you through uh, quite a few years of uh, how this replacement plan works. <coughs> in this replacement plan, we're also going to look at taking out Forestry 1 or Forestry 2. But one's going now and one's going in three years. You pick which one you want to replace first. We're not trying to replace everything at once. It should be noted that in terms of purchasing and, and capital and expenditures, we try not to buy too many products the same year because that means you have to replace all those products within the same year and the burden. It just doesn't make sense to do it that way. We try to space these things out so there is some reality, fiscal reality to this plan. 
and there are some priorities that will be set by the fire chief and the team to make sure that this is consistent with operations and this is the way moving forward in terms of needs and assessment. Uh, one of the things that we did is that there are two replacement plans. There's an A and a B. A is obviously the preferred. B is the one that if you can't do A for whatever reason, at least you got a B. We didn't write the report in such a way that you were going to be pigeonholed and you got to do all of this. You, you got to do this, do it this way now. Uh, human nature says we don't like to be backed into a corner and we didn't plan on doing that anytime soon here or anywhere else that we're invited in to do this kind of work. So there are a couple choices. Obviously, the A plan that you're seeing now is the one that's way preferable. It's going to get you to a better place certainly quicker than the B. In this plan, 2017, we had the one engine going away at the end of 16. So we had one engine being replaced in 2017. Then we have a breather to get some capital to put back together. In 2020, we are replacing the other forestry unit that wasn't replaced in 2017. And then in 2020, we are retiring one of the ladders, which was the one that was in lesser condition than the other. And in 2020, we are replacing ladder three. So right now, that's for the next few years, because I, I, I didn't detail out 30 years from now. Whatever. So this is the immediate need that we see for the expensive stuff, which is replacing apparatus. The other part that we wanted to instill in our report, and it's a separate section in this report, is the maintenance. And I'm not going to pull up pictures of tires to demonstrate that. But one of the critical issues for us, and one of the things we want to instill, is the culture of preventative maintenance and keeping the vehicles at their optimum running position. To do that, we are looking at enhancing the documentation, which we were speaking about earlier, which is in place. It's beginning to come together. We're seeing that documentation take root. We then want to make sure that preventative maintenance, routine maintenance, annual inspections are funded and that they are done. And this includes <coughs> annual ladder testing, ground ladder testing, post testing, pump testing, as well as investing in having all the equipment and tools that are already in inventory provided with mounts to be properly mounted in the vehicles. Most of that stuff when a new vehicle arrives with transfer moves equipment and those mounting once you've invested in it, they'll move from the first vehicle to the new vehicle. So you don't have to keep buying that stuff, but it's good to get everything organized. The other evidence we saw, and this is more, and it comes off as being a personal opinion, it's not meant to, but it's the easiest way to present it. One of the things, you're, you're a blended culture as a fire department. You're in the process of blending. And then there's bumps in the road. That's not an easy thing to do. But you're in that process. You're, you're going down that path. Standardization becomes very, very important for you because eventually these cultures, at least at some level, they're going to merge. They're eventually going to merge and they're going to coalesce and they're going to work together. Thankfully, I'm Jeopardy. I don't have to spell coalesce. I don't think I could. But anyway, they're going to begin to merge together. Standardization is key. So as you create specific locations, specific operating functions, color coding, labeling, and tool mounting, that becomes what you move forward through the rest of the fleet. And what we see here is many, you have many different brands in inventory. You have some new vehicles you acquired, you have some used vehicles you acquired, you have some basically homemade vehicles that you've presented. You've now got to get all of this stuff in these different directions you've gone and define yourselves. Once you define yourselves in that rhythm, that look, that brand, that mounting, that organization, stick to it. So there's an investment for tools, there's an investment for testing, there's an investment for documentation. I'm sorry, we're going to play catch up and buy quite a few tires for vehicles. And I will say this, if some of the vehicles that are due for replacement, and I say this sincerely, and, 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 and I, I shouldn't name names to the right from the court, I'm going to name names to the public record. I had a fire commissioner in New York State, Danby, New York, ask me the following question because he thought it was almost like some sort of biblical riddle. But if you've given me a truck that's on your replacement list, but you say it needs tires, why would I buy tires for something that you're telling me to get rid of next year? And I was like, are you serious? That's like that slow pitch under here. Here, hit that. <laughs> it was pretty easy. If something happens, you don't take that truck out of service tonight and stop using it and you decide to use something that we're telling you is defective, that you know is defective, even if you're going to get rid of it in a year, you've got 365 days of risk that you've decided as a group to acquire in the old, for what? 
the tires are a lot cheaper than your first insurance claim. I mean, come on, <laughs> this is not that hard. But there, there, there really was. Can't we just ignore part of it and do the other part? Like, don't we, isn't this a cafeteria? Is this a buffet and I pick and choose what I want? No, no it's not. The most important thing you've got going for you right now is a campaign to document your service needs, a clear path to get some of those service things taken care of. You, much like everyone on, on the Northeast, everybody I meet, has an issue with corrosion underneath their fire apparatus and ambulances. It's there. If anybody doesn't agree with us, grab a creeper, meet us underneath when we're done with this meeting. It's there. We can show it to you. Go ahead. It's been a problem perennially throughout time. The last six years or so, it, it's really gotten extraordinarily bad. I don't know what road departments are putting on roads. Calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, beet juice out in the Midwest. I don't even know what's in that stuff. But whatever it is, it's taking the undersides of fire trucks and, and just basically rotting them out. A couple of things that we came across, and actually much by accident, this is kind of a neat story. We went to do a fleet evaluation in uh, Pennsylvania in West Grove, Pennsylvania, they had an 03 truck made by Brand X, and they had an 09 truck made by the same manufacturer. So I'm under the 03 truck, and what they chose to do is paint the underside of the truck the same color that they painted the top of the truck. So basically, all the components, both top side and underneath, were all treated, primed, and painted the same way. That truck looked perfect underneath the 09 truck, which at the time that we viewed it was five years old, required $15,800 in rust restoration after we left to get it where it like should be. And that's after just five years of use. And so I asked the question, I said, well, why did you paint the underside of this truck back in 03, thinking that there was some magical brain thing here? And then why did you take the underside of the 09? Well, in 03, we were big praters, and we liked to win trophies, and so we painted the underside so we could keep it clean and win trophies. How much does it cost to paint the underside of a fire truck? About $800 to $1,000. So sometimes when you specify a fire truck, it's better to spend a little bit of money on the front end and save a whole bunch of money on the back end. How many people in that department wish they would have checked the box for $800? after they spent $15,800 at, at the end of year five for their newer truck. That that's kind of a no-brainer, non-starter. We should have checked the box. They did not. So that's one thing that you can do from a specification point of view moving forward is to make sure that the underside of the truck is treated, uh, prepared, and painted like the top side. The second thing is, <coughs> Our firm, we go to the big heavy-duty truck show, which is about all heavy-duty trucks in Indianapolis in March. And we get to talking to road DPW commissioners, and these are the people spreading the stuff on the roads that have trucks as well. Well, what's the service life of your truck? Well, 18 years. Well, you're putting this stuff on the ground. How can you get 18 years out of the truck? Well, I said it's pretty easy. What we do is, is that we spray clean the whole truck off at the end of the season, and then we have this coating that we put on annually that inhibits any rust from getting in. And that treatment is uh, two or three hundred dollars a truck. So those are things on that side that are fairly inexpensive to do rather than 15 or 10, you know, five, 10 or 15 years down the road investing hundreds of thousands, potentially tens of thousands of dollars in trying to keep the truck on the road to get it to the 20 year end of its service life. And that's all stuff that you can do before time. So that's kind of our spiel on corrosion. It's a big deal. Um, it's it's a nationwide thing, depending on, on where you are. It's worse. Um, I know that one fire truck manufacturer was doing some testing of new products in Ohio because Ohio has some of the most corrosive stuff um, that they're putting on the road. So. All right, uh, all we have left is when we talk about replacing the forestry units, and it was just food for thought items, but we were talking a little bit before the meeting about phones and different things that are out there. And even with a forestry, wildland firefighting, uh, whatever you want to call it, when we follow the standard, what we're looking to do 
on replacing the two forestry units you have. We're going to try to minimize climbing for the crews, um, which seems to break Justin's position because the forestry truck's meant to be high to get over all the terrain and everything. But yet, we're talking about not climbing on that vehicle. There are ways that we accomplish that in closed storage so that we're not worried about uh, any risk of having to climb off the vehicle in transit, making it in something that can actually live in your environment and not be used all the time and not dry rot while it's sitting in the station. There are very specific things that we need to build in the design to accomplish that, which we do. And there are many factors we work with and recommend that we do that um, as third party crews. And then we emphasize safety. We do recommend, uh, there's a lot of folks that believe in falsely, don't know where it started in the industry. There are folks that believe that when you get into a Ford F550 or a Dodge 5500, any of those vocational smaller vehicles, that you don't have to follow the NFPA standards for vehicle data recorders and safety equipment. That is simply not the case. Those manufacturers actually offer those vocational coded equipment items that do appear in NFPA 1901. And we do recommend to folks that even if you're designing in some of these forestry units, you do have to buy a fire vocation chassis. It is different than an ordinary safety chassis. There are folks all the time that tell us, well, I got such a deal on the state bid, whatever personal authority I used, I didn't buy a fire truck, but I bought a cheap pickup. Nice, but it doesn't meet the standard. That's why they're cheap, but they're not meant to be a part of it. And so we talked about that with some folks. Uh, yeah, you probably don't know what it is, but uh, we were using this last night. It looks to me a lot like a race car, but in a department I was at, they actually called it. And so I thought I would end with that because it's rather entertaining. With that, we're open to questions over here. But that, well, there's also has to be a fairly lengthy report with that, and that wasn't available. So that sticker might have been a holdover from the previous owner. When we get a ladder report and we're doing the evaluation, the report's been done in advance. We actually take that report, we take the truck out back, and check what the inspector indicated, and we see if we have corroborating evidence to that report. It's not that we don't agree with the inspector, but it's good to check and see what they found and if those repairs were done or if what they were writing was actually. That, that brings up another good point in our previous question. We went to a community in Massachusetts that produced a ladder test. We took the truck out back to compare it. Uh, the last 10 feet of a 75 foot ladder took a bronze bend yes, to the right. Uh, okay, and so immediately I quizzed the chief. Who tested the ladder? Well, it was, you know, Dumb and Dumber Ladder Test Company. It wasn't anybody reputable that actually tested the truck. I said, you need to go get a reputable company to go out and test this truck. And when they got the test results back and shared it with us, they had six critical items on the truck that were actually wrong with the truck that needed to be fixed that were of, of great safety concern. So just like anything else that you buy, not everybody testing trucks is created equal. You need to get a rest, reputable firm um, that's going to do of the work correctly and then put the sticker on if it passes and so on and so forth. Um, sure. so I have a question about the liability. You mentioned tires and a number of overweight vehicles. Um, now we can't reasonably take every vehicle that you flag as needing to be replaced out of the fleet today. But, uh, so if any of those vehicles had an accident, you own it. So now our insurance is moot on those vehicles, essentially. I wouldn't say it's moot, but the reality is that there's been a problem identified. Take, for instance, tires. Um, there were a number of vehicles that were identified with needed tires. Um, every time they leave the station, you're rolling the dice and nothing happens. If they get in an accident, believe you me, um, they're going to go. They're going to be going through, and some attorney's going to get that, and that's going to be fired for more money than the lawsuit. And again, we're not here to scare anybody. This isn't meant to do that. It's just the reality of the world that we live in. 
Um, it used to be, it's pretty interesting how fire service has evolved over the last hundred years. As a volunteer firefighter, a coal firefighter in this community, up until about maybe 15 or 20 years ago, all of us in the fire service were viewed as good people with white helmets that came and saved babies and uh, did fire prevention seminars and were just all around great people. And then all of a sudden something happened and an attorney, and if anybody's in the law profession here, I apologize in advance, but they're not necessarily uh, a top 10 of my favorite list because uh, attorneys in many cases have taken some really good entities in this country and have basically ruined them. And the fire service to one degree, which is just part of my heart and soul, is one of them. Uh, it was found out that you folks, because of taxpayer funding, had what most consider deep pockets. And so now we became vulnerable with you in lawsuits. And anybody that wants some really good laughs, you can go on Sadie.com. Who's Sadie? Sadie was the woman who dropped the hot McDonald's coffee in her crotch and burned her crotch and sued for and, and got a ton of money. So they have the Sadie Awards, awards each year for the most frivolous, unbelievable lawsuits that managed to get money. The woman that went to Walmart sued because she slipped in some soda. It wasn't all that funny until they figured out that the kids, the woman's four-year-old kid is the one that spilled the soda, and she won $275,000 from Walmart. But probably the grandiose of all was Mr. Grabowski, who bought a Winnebago and decided to put it on cruise control and go back in the back of the Winnebago and make a cup of coffee. Well, nature took its course and it kept driving until it crashed because nobody was at the wheel. Uh, Mr. Grabowski was awarded $1.7 million, a brand new Winnebago, and now if you buy a Winnie, it says in the operator's manual, you need to stay in the seat when you put it on cruise control and not go make coffee. <coughs> you go look at the new fire truck out there, that KME fire truck. Every warning label, every caution label on that truck was a lawsuit that that manufacturer lost. And so we have become a very litigious society. I don't make the rules up. We just try to enlighten people to, so that you as a political entity and you as a fire department and you as citizens can understand the risk. What you do with that risk is entirely up to you. We're just here to point out that you're at risk. Uh, and it's serious. You know, it's almost like gambling, you know? Every time a truck leaves here that doesn't have the proper tires on, you're gambling and it's going to make it. And if it does, hooray for you, and if it doesn't, I feel really sorry for you, um, because it's, it's, it's going to be unpleasant. There's no getting around. Now, Mike, Sir. your report, our report now, you know, tells us a lot about these things, which is really good. You know, Truth be told, if we had a fatal accident, we would have engineers and inspectors that are looking at our trucks and finding these things. So we have to start to look forward to changing these things because no matter what, you have a serious accident, trucks going to be inspected like a DOP or anything else on the road, like trailer trucks. Generally, what happens in any serious fatality? What happened to the building? in where 36 people just lost their lives. Nobody was in or out, okay? Law enforcement will come in and investigators and they will confiscate your truck. And it will be going through seven ways to Sunday. And then <coughs> the report, that will probably be um, if they find out that it exists, which is pretty easy because it's, a lot of people put them on the internet. We don't, but a lot of people do that have ownership rights to it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and that will become basically a roadmap. So, um, and that's no reason not to do the report. I don't want to make it sound like that, but the reality is, is that that's one of many things that will be looked at going down the road. Now that we've 
that was the, the impetus for, for asking like to do the report so we'd understand what issues we're going to be facing and this is going to be very important to the capital planning committee this will be the roadmap as he said for, for our planning for the immediate future but for the next 20 years basically um, and those things that are identified as emergencies um, we do have the reserve fund um, and i will be addressing that <coughs> we had a lesson uh, just a little while ago on tires and how to read dates and what to do and we're not just going to drop the truck off we're going to have people actually look at the tires here that understand tires and make sure you get what you paid for getting the right size tires which could uh, affect the vehicle's ability to carry the weight that's indicative of the tag in it so we brought uh, those folks up to speed and just to let you know you know it seems like there's not a lot of good news and like there's at times maybe hopeless. And not to embarrass them, but there's somebody here from another community that lives in your community that's a fire chief. And we did work for him many, many years ago uh, in Raleigh. And at that time, he had a worn out old fleet, uh, dilapidated, uh, not a lot of money, firehouse. Uh, and he asked us to come in and do this work. And he is a bright, shining light uh, with my company because he took this for what it was and he implemented this blueprint. And Rally has a much better fleet and a much stronger fire department today than when Chief Driver came in and took uh, over based on our partnership and the ability to follow this plan to get funded and to get his people into some better equipment. So I just wanted to bring that up because it is there, there is a good news story here. If you choose to follow what was written and you do it right and fund it, um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not all terrible. Uh, you can get there. There's living proof right, right south of here that you can if you have uh, the will and the fortitude to, to, to do it. So, and we are here. Uh, another thing that I always explain to anybody that hires us, this is not a wham bam thank you ma'am from any of your community. Uh, do some consulting work and leave. Uh, we have formed a relationship uh, with Chief Walker, uh, just like we have years ago with Chief Brother. Uh, we are a resource, okay? We are in this for a long haul. It's not a wham bam, thank you ma'am, come in and take your money and leave town, never to be heard of again. Uh, if you want us to be involved, uh, we can be as involved or not as involved, but we are always a phone call away as a resource and the Chief knows that. If he has any questions, if you have any questions, one of the things I'll do before I leave you, we'll each get a business card. Like I said, we are in this for the long haul. Uh, you have made a significant investment with us to come and perform this work. I'll be in time to follow through this And there's not, and, and on point, there's not many consultants that will do that. But we believe in what we do very strongly. Uh, we are. We are change agents, we are advocates for firefighter safety, community safety, and we really strongly believe in what we do. Is there any other questions from anybody in the group that we could entertain? Now's the time, folks. Don't leave here and, and, and have a question at hand, please. What is the replacement cost for all the tires that need immediate replacement? <laughs> um, we were talking out in the truck bay, and Goodyear tires are on state bid, and there's actually somebody that we put you in contact with who will actually, I think, come in and do it. Um, do you have a cool Sullivan tire? And how much? How much are you paying? Uh, average, eight, six, seven. About five hundred dollars a tire. Five hundred dollars. Depends on the size, but they will come to the station and change them right here. So you don't have to take the truck. We will tell you how to how to look at the tires so that you get newer tires. You get the make of the tires you're actually getting. Our new tires, a lot of these companies like to sell older tires. Mike showed us how to look at that stuff. Um, we've implemented a lot of this stuff that we can in the plan. We put in Channing and, you know, in part as doing our preventative maintenance. We started the documentation program. You know, we did we, two private fire company uh, companies information that we had to pool together to get these guys as much information as we could. We formalize it now in the program in the IMC. So it's helped us move forward. You know, the tires are in the budget. Uh, you know, we started to look at, you know, securing stuff in cabinets, 
taking stuff off those overweight, overweight, uh, overweight apparatuses. And if you look at the report, there's a lot of stuff that we were able to do to start to get going. But as you can see, it's a, it's a road to hoe. Um, but like Mike said, Raleigh is a good example of following it. And if you walk over and you see the effort apparatus and how they put it together, it's, it's really something. Um, and not to say between uh, Mike and Tom and Keith that are here, you're talking some of the uh, most experienced uh, firefighters, you know, firefighter in the Bronx, you know, 30 something years, Ladderman, you know, not just Tom Sheehan, the other fellows here, specs, uh, trucks from the Navy, has worked for almost every single, as well as Keith, manufacturer of fire truck in this country. These guys know what they're doing. Um, and it was, it's been an unbelievable experience to be part of with, I mean, this, when you read comic books about your superheroes, that's kind of what, you know, these guys <laughs> were when they, come, when they came here. The information that we were able to glean from that time spent here, was unbelievable. So, uh, and it reflects another report. I read the report when I first got it back in the spring, and I, uh, I, I like the fact that it gives us. It's not saying you have to take a whole big bite of the pie now and just eat. Um, it's a map. I think it's doable. I think as long as we show some direction, movement in the right direction, I think God forbid there was an incident. That would be somewhat in our, in our favor. Or he's going down the right road. We just didn't choose to take this and put it in the drawer and close it in a And, and that sometimes happens. Believe me. Make no mistake about that. That happens. I know. So I, I appreciate that. That you didn't do that. Yeah. Well, I think it should be doing notice for the just for payment. Yeah. Something that the question that Alicia asked. Yeah. 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 Y
so that you're not going back and revisiting the issue. You have several attending issues here. You can't do one poorly and then go to the next one and because that one's going to come back and haunt you. You as a group need to do one, do it well, fund it properly, and then move on to the next and, and do it right. And then you will get healthy over time. Anything less than that, and it's not going to be. It's just not going to be. Pardon? Well, that's the other end. Uh, Chief Walker has made inroads by hiring somebody on a part time basis. Um, and that is a really uh, terrific start. You, you need to have somebody that's certified taking care of your trucks. If you think about it, in this town, the single most expensive expenditure on wheels is in this firehouse right now. Anything more expensive than what you own here, if you can count the sewer truck, and the DPW trucks, the most expensive thing on wheels is that Latin truck that you to replace. Anything more expensive than that, and you're hiring an architect and building a building. And so it is money well spent to take somebody and hire them to protect that investment, especially if you're going to make significant capital expenditures in the future here as part of that investment. That is money well, well spent. You, you Chief Walker and the board for funding that, you were on the right path there for sure, without any question. Um, speaking of funding and purchasing, you talked about there being for the main chief fire trucks, are rebuilds a bad investment and used trucks a bad investment? Like a refer or? Yeah. Here's what happens. You have a 10-year-old truck. You decide to refer. If you put, say, arbitrary $200,000 into that truck, the expectation then is, is that you're going to get another 10 years out of it to complete the service line, right? But then, that's engine one. But then we find out that engine three is due that same year. So what have you just done to yourself? Screwed up your schedule. Right. Some schedule. Can I put an asterisk for your better than this question? One thing that does work in your plate that works well for rebuilding are your ambulances. The ambulance world will replace the chassis, the air conditioning system. The original manufacturer, your two newer vehicles are ATV. American Emergency Vehicles, known as ATV, does their own rechassis. The difference between a refurb and a rechassis, the original sticker on a refurb fire truck is still the original building. That's, that's the date that it's identified. When you take an old ambulance and you bring it down and rechassis it, it is that model of your chassis that's considered a new ambulance, both in the eyes of your insurance and the eyes of the NFPA, it's a new vehicle. So ambulances have always lent themselves more to that refurb, rechassis moment because their chassis is part of the replenishment program and they do that for about two-thirds the price of a new vehicle. So it's financially, it makes sense. It's something that your crew is used to. And again, if they've had a long service life with the ambulance, they like it, it works for them, they like the interior, and then it lends itself to be rechassis. Fire truck world, what happens is, ordinarily when a fire truck gets to the end of its service life, whatever the original bid was for the reefer, once someone has your truck and they start tearing it to pieces and finding things, they have what we refer to as the uh oh moments. Oh, we found this. Oh, we found that. Oh, we found that. We're done. <laughs> it's exceeded the value when it comes back. So there's a breakover point. Reefer, sometimes it makes sense because it's a low mileage, good diesel engine, good transmission, good axle. Sometimes it makes sense to do a fire kit with a new chassis. Sometimes we have to do a fair amount of research before we ever approve those things. We come in and evaluate the vehicle inside the building. Here's what happens those are all really gimmicks. Whether you refurb a truck, or whether you buy a used truck, or whether we just had a department that wanted to lease a truck, you continually are doing what? You are operating from a position of weakness and you are behind. What you are doing, just say somebody came in here and said, oh, you should lease a truck. You are taking monies in 2018, 2019, and 2020 that you should be saving for the new ladder in 2020. And you're spending them on an old lease with a truck that in five years has five years of use on it. And so you are taking 
future dollars that should be spent on future purchases and trying to catch up using them in, in what I would term is not a very good proof way to use your money. Okay. The reality is particularly here with what we found, okay, you already have a bunch of used trucks in your fleet that were bought used by the, the two different departments, which again is not nothing wrong at the time. But you've taken all this stuff over and now you are in a position that you hold the liability and you hold the position that you have to have. And the reality is is that um, any quick fix gimmicks for cost avoidance aren't going to work here. Unfortunately, you are at a precipice here where you need to pony up and you need to get get some new trucks here and get rid of some of the old older trucks and that new fleet. Um, you're, you're, as you look at the whole big picture of both firehouses and the entire fleet, you're quite frankly in the you're not in a position here to try any of that. It's it's only going to be self defeating, and you're not you're, you're not going to get help. You're not. Yes, sir. I'm curious. In nineteen in twenty seventeen, what's a new ladder cost? Average. For what you have out there, um, given everything that we know, um, ladder trucks today are around a million dollars. That's what the cost of doing business is. That's up for replacement in 2020. Uh, you're looking at three years from now. Um, it's still going to be a, around a million and maybe a little bit more. Uh, it's just uh, one of the things that we recommended is get rid of getting rid of the pump and the tank and the hose on that. You have enough pumpers here. Uh, you need something uh, with a lot of portable ladders. Uh, when we went out um, the Barrier Island out there with all the three and four story homes with no access to the back where firefighters can get trapped and have to jump out the windows, you need a lot more portable ladders than what you carry. And so. Um, when we wrote, we actually wrote a, uh, a list of uh, 20 or 30 items in the report that your new ladder should have. And that was a straight ladder, short wheelbase, easy to get around uh, to some of those more uh, remote areas that are going to need portable ladder service and aerial service, uh, and fill it up with portable ladders. And that was a recommendation. So the fact that we're cutting out the pump and the tank and the hose on that is going to make that unit uh, quite a bit cheaper when it comes time for replacement versus what's there now. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Chief Robert from Raleigh. I'll let you know, I live on Old Raleigh Road. Uh, thank you for paving the road, too. So I, I was happy. Um, give you a little more information on the, on the current cost of a ladder truck. Uh, the one I have right now costs us seven hundred fifteen thousand dollars last year. There is a program out, and Nate is a member of the Fire Chiefs Association of Massachusetts, and they have a cooperative bid or purchasing program, and apparatus is one of the things that they talk about. I purchased our ladder truck and rally on this uh, cooperative bid. You can get on uh, the MAPC website, which is the Municipal Boston Area Planning Committee, uh, and that's where they have the link to this program. You can find out, you can pick a uh, We'll use E1 for an example, that's what I have. But there's six vendors that are on that list, and you can look at a ladder truck and design it the way, the way you want it. You can find exactly how much that ladder truck's gonna cost you, because all the bid work and all that other stuff is gonna take care of for you already. That's one of the member benefits of being on the Fire Chiefs Association of Massachusetts. So you can get a good idea how much that truck is gonna cost. You can get it with a pump, you can get it with a tank, you can get it without a tank, you can get a 100 foot, 75 foot, whatever size ladder you want, a tower, whatever, pick it out. Figure out what you want and that price, you'll be able to tell what the price is at the end. And then that's the money you go after. You call the manufacturer of the truck that you'd like to use because it's all, all the bidding has already been done for you. Call that manufacturer, you know, the dealer, and you sit down and start filling out the paperwork for the order pretty easy and it gives you a good idea what it's going to cost you. The, the, the term for that, and I didn't know you did that, they're called purchasing authorities. 
One of the bigger ones that's used countrywide is HGAC, which is the Houston, Galveston, Texas purchasing authority, where they fit out multiple trucks for multiple users. In that, there are some rules with that. Basically, what you are buying is a basically a, a floor truck, and then you are allowed to change 20% of the purchase price of that truck by adding on things that would be needed here to serve this community. Uh, other things that you can do, you can add on. If you have uh, somebody that's bought a truck recently, right, potentially uh, rally, uh, and what they did, and you want to buy the identically same thing, uh, you could potentially add on to that for around the same cost with maybe uh, percentage added on for cost of living adjustments that would occur over the, the time from the time that they paid for the truck and you're going to pay for your truck. So there are a number of things that you can do in, in purchasing uh, other than going to straight bid. Sometimes we use RFPs. It really depends uh, on, on the situation. There, there's good and bad with any of that. Um, and as far as us, we try to teach potential clients what the, the pluses and minuses are, and then it's up to those folks to figure out if that's going to be a good fit for them. Uh, it worked well for Chief Roderick, for sure. We use that FKM, that bid system player in your tent. So we're familiar with how that works, too. Okay. Question, Mike. Sir. We're trying to understand, for capital planning purposes and forecasting, what we're going to be up against with time frames. If we have a truck, that is approaching the NFPA standards of 20 years of service. Yes, sir. But it has new tires, and it has passed every conceivable inspection that we put it through on a yearly basis. Right. And we get in an accident, because supposedly 20 years is still a life expectancy issue. That's the life expectancy. That's not the, the ding ding that it needs to go out the door and you're going to face losses if you don't. So that's we still fine. have, as we capital plan, if we have a truck that's a year or three over, but it's still maintained in good condition, we're it's not going to trigger a loss. No. You're A-OK. -okay. You're, you're A-OK. -okay. But um, I, I will say this, um, and I made this statement before, you really need to get going on this because well, we know that. you don't want to get in that position. The other thing, right now, Take for the ladder out there. The lead time for that is 12 to 14 months. Because of the uptick in the economy and because of the uptick of people buying trucks that didn't in 08, 09, 10, 11, when the economy was improper, um, there's been a, a, a dramatic uptick in orders. And so if we all agreed on what to buy tonight and we sign the contract tonight, you're not seeing a new truck here until probably March of 2018 for a lot. Pumpers are a little shorter, tractor drawings are even longer, uh, specialty rescue vehicles are a year or more uh, for that. And so with the replacement of the ladder due in 2020, that's when it's rolling through the front door here. Uh, it would not be premature at all for Chief Walker to put an apparatus committee together sometime mid-year this year and start working on that replacement. And Lord only knows we have an engine in there before that, I believe, uh, that that needs to go like right away. So um, Chief Walker needs to put a committee together um, and they're going to need to get busy here because we need to get some work done. Um, depending on how hard the apparatus committee works, depending on the salesman, and a lot of other outside influences just to get a set of specs together, get it out to bid if that's it, or if you're going to a purchasing authority, um, it could be as little as two to four months or as long as eight to 12 months. So that's a year just getting to the point of getting ready to go to contract. And then once you go to contract until the build's done is another 12 to 14 months. So you're looking at a good two years at least from inception until something drives down Main Street here in Newberry. And, and that's the, the time frame. And so the idea of getting a ladder truck here in 2020, um, you want to be at contract and ready to go by the end of 2018 for sure. Um, what is the value in the vehicles that are retired, if any? It depends. Like, um, 
quite frankly, due to the liability involved, I would not sell your forestry units to anything other than a farmer that wants to squirt chemicals or something or water their fields. Um, for fire service use, that has no intrinsic value. Um, your engine nine that's out of the fleet first is overweight. Um, it was sold once before. Um, resale on um, trucks like that uh, is not that great be honest with you, they're past their service life because everybody's trying to do what you do, get into trucks that are compliant and have uh, up-to-date safety standards and stuff. So can I interject real quick? Yes, I two forest creatures probably find a home in South America and there are brokers, uh, friendly mountain and fire tech, both of those organizations and their dot coms so you can look them up online. Fill out an application with them, send them some pictures, they're gonna move those to South America where Diesel engines are our preferred, and a truck with a small pump with all-wheel drive is absolutely what they want. So you will find that if there are buyers out there, there won't be much. Um, you'll probably be shocked at, I'm guessing, four to five thousand dollars. Most trucks pass through service like you end up in containers. Yeah. Other countries they don't see. They're just scrap. No, they become fire trucks. No, they become fire trucks. <laughs> so. Uh, you get off but when you go, on a cruise ship, you're being protected. But, but when you go to Cosmo on a cruise ship, yeah. and don't be shocked if you look out and see Engine yeah. 9 from Newberry <laughs> yeah. pulling around the corner. Uh, not at all. No. And the people in the multi-million yeah. shower hotels have no idea what's coming if they call an emergency. They're, they're in peace. Yeah. If anything comes. Yep. If anything comes. That's correct. That's very true. Yeah. We take a lot for granted that we have excellent emergency services. And in you know, countries like that, not so much. Mike, do we have any other questions? Because we still get a long meeting ahead of us tonight, too. But yeah. have you, has anyone got, Jay, yeah, I'm sure one of those trucks might be good for spraying the field, right? Mike, right. did you ask me to change the all wheel drive? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did I get any questions for the guys? Uh, yeah, what's the best deal? Thank right. you. Okay, what's the best manufacturer? We get that question all the time. It really depends what you want to buy. Okay. <coughs> for for my experience, Pierce Seagrave are both pretty good manufacturers. Um, if I wanted to buy an aerial tower or tower ladder, I'd buy it from Seagrave. If I wanted to buy an aerial tower or mid mount. I'd buy it from anybody but Pierce because their design is terrible. So it kind of, um, and not to evade the question, but it kind of matters. Um, but one of the most important things, and I, I got to tell that story because he asked a question. Uh, my chief friend Robert back there loves Seagrave. Um, so he bought any one? Why? He bought three of them, but he loves Seagrave. He actually hated any one. Why did he buy any one? Because he'll fix it. There's somebody here in Massachusetts 20 minutes down the road or 40 minutes down the road that'll fix it when it breaks. I thought it was going to fit the building. Okay. Well, it fit the building, it fit his budget, and they fix it. And what we're finding is some places, some people that make good trucks don't necessarily sell in a particular area in the country because they have very poor dealer support, if they have a dealer at all. And that was the gig with Seagrave. Okay, so the first thing that we try to teach people is, regardless of what brand you want, the first question we ask is, okay, who's selling it to you and where's the repair facility? Who's going to, who's going to fulfill the warranty requirements that you just bought with your truck? And you take, like I was just in Grand, I was just in Teton Village in Wyoming, they bought a Rosenbauer T-Rex. Where was it? It was in Salt Lake City, four and a half hours away. That was where the service facility was for the truck. And then on the way back, it blew a fuel pump, and then it blew another one. There were more miles on this thing driving it back and forth to Salt Lake than they actually put on the truck in its first year of life in Teton Village, protecting that skier. So um, that, that, that's the overwhelming question. It doesn't matter who buys and builds the truck, it could be the best truck out there, but all trucks break and need maintenance and warranty work, where are you gonna get it fixed? And Mike, there's nowhere around. I'm the one that can't still be gonna get, but one question. Certainly. 
when we may be diminished the need somewhat for a ladder truck, don't we still need ladder trucks to get water out of over buildings? What are, why aren't we we have two size buildings still here even though we don't have like a lot of you know, factories and things, but First I mean, off, you need a ladder truck here because the insurance service office says you do. Okay, and if you want to get a bunch of angry people here, particularly business owners, uh, decide to do away with your ladder and tell ISO, and they will be here at their next meeting because they will have a substantial raise in their insurance rates. But moreover than that, uh, and this is kind of something, we have a ladder truck here for your firefighters. They're the ones going off the ground, putting their necks at risk for little or no remuneration. Okay. What really scared me about being here and in the tour that we got is the lack of portable ladders for the wood frame houses out on the barrier island that are three and four stories off the back in the rear yard with no access for the area itself. That scares the heck out of me. How can I say that? because my company, Ladder 27, lost two of its members by diving out of a Bronx building in what was later referred to as Black Sunday. They were trapped by the fire, they had no way out, and they jumped out and killed themselves. Nobody wants that here. And so you need to have a ladder truck here. Yeah, you need this thing that does that, but more importantly, you need the amount of portable ladders it's gonna cover. Because for your firefighters, they are risking their necks out there every day on some of this stuff, and we need to have a way to get them out. And that's the best way to get them out if they get in trouble. And yes, they're for civilians um, as well. There's no question about that. Um, but moreover, we say that those, those ladders, and the aerial device itself. So you absolutely need one here. That's not a choice. OK, it's a choice of maybe what kind you buy or who you buy it from. But the fact of having one here, that's not a choice. You don't want to take that one as a governing body. You need to have one here. And we don't need tanks because, you know, basically you can run the hose up and use it, and one of the engines to, fuel, to, to, to run water out of it when you go to massive trains if it's one of those where you put water on it. So we have points now that have pumps and tanks, but like I said, it's a lot of weight. You don't always get to have a 100-foot stick or all those portable ladders. So we're better off in the research finding that a truck with a lot of space for portable ladders based on what we're looking at down there. And just a pure ladder truck would be a better fit for us. And we don't make recommendations slightly. We look at the whole picture before we come up with a recommendation like that. Because for here internally, that's a big change to go from what we have to something a lot different than the fire truck. People generally, the fire trucks in particular, aren't really all that great to change. But it just cried for that solution to the fire problem. Any other questions, comments? Did we keep you? Thank you for your time. Uh, for my family, tears. Thank you for the work. We appreciate you inviting we are into your community to offer this uh, very important, uh, this very important work for you and the fire department in your community. And on behalf of uh, my company and my family, and Keith's family, I want to wish everybody a very merry Christmas and a happy new year and a healthy new year as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Um, we have a one day liquor license and we have three of them. And it's the same entity, so you take them as three as one. And this is the right to the asset. Uh, it's all kinds of fatal as they see it. We have a date of December 10th, 2016, from 7 30 p.m. to 10 30 p.m. We have Five Field Community Act Center, Cat and Cradle, December 23, 2016, from 7.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. What we have the same is January 14, 2017, from 7.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We also have new business license renewals, or business license renewals. 217. They are as follows. I'll try to expedite an annual conference center. Uh, wheelhouse parking lot, which is Jerry, Jerry Dean Door. Um, 
Fantasia's Flowers on Main Street, Bell Island Grill, uh, Siemens Sculpture by Beverly Siemens, uh, Supreme's Driving School, Prime Management Consultant, Flukes and Fines, Henry C. Becker Custom Building, Tell Me If I Skip One, Noise Auto Service, Damage Butchery, The Sanctuary B&B, Little River Realty Trust, uh, Tolman's Auto, and Beach Coma Restaurant. If you feel those are all in order, I take a motion to accept all the 217. Motion to accept all businesses. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, we have had a special town meeting with the result of the number eight ballot election. Um, we need to discuss some of this. Chuck's not here. I'd probably like a full board on some of this, but I think we're going to discuss some of it tonight. We need to decide if we want to have a special town meeting or wait to an annual town meeting to try to, uh, because we feel that the other town meeting to take the results of the ballot uh, to the town meeting. So I would take some discussion on that and at least explore some of what people are thinking, whether we try to call a special town meeting, it's probably close to Christmas, we could call it after Christmas, I imagine, or do we wait to the spring annual town meeting? So, open. Well, I've been uh, talking to Ginny a little bit about what our options are, uh, because I'd thought I'd initially understood our options to be different than what they are because we hadn't set a money amount at the town meeting because it the motion passed. I thought we could actually change the money amount or offer two different more items with different money amounts. Um, but it looks like that is not an option. So we are, she, as she understands it through talking to the state, the, even though there was no money written on the ballot item, we are locked in at the 6.5 we know is insufficient to, possibly insufficient to do everything we'd like to get done. Um, however, I think it might still behoove us to bring that before town meeting again to see if we can get the approval so we at least have something moving forward. I think we, of course, because I always think this so far, I think we should also put another ballot measure before on the next ballot when uh, I'm up for election to try and do the whole kit and caboodle because I think it makes a lot more sense. The overwhelming majority of people at town meetings have voted to approve it. And if we have a backup that's just the police and the renovations at town hall we can't get the three facilities, whatever they are, if they're combined facilities or standalone facilities or whatever the way is to solve all three problems done, and we can at least have something for the police and a renovation for town hall sort of in the back pocket, whether or not we do that at town meeting or at a special town meeting. At, I don't have any particular answer. Drea, Bar Alicia, whichever one is ready to go. I think it's important that we stay at 6.5. Um, I like the way we're going. Um, I was very relieved that it passed at the ballot. Um, I think we need to continue down the road. We believe. And um, as far as when we vote on it, I think we should call a special meeting. All right, what we'll do is we'll. Uh Listen to what Alicia wants to say, so then we'll kind of come back to the point of time. All right, Alicia? Way down the end. Well, I think we have to definitely bring it to the town meeting. I'm just not so sure which is the best way to go. We should wait till the spring, or we should have a special town meeting. I'm hoping to hear pros and cons from each side. All right, so it's back to me. Um, and to fill in a little bit on what Amy said, I think I have my information right. It kind of came across just recently to me about what Raleigh is doing. I think Raleigh is building a freestanding police station and they're putting a very large addition, keeping, I think, dispatch and cell block on their police station. So I think a lot of people thought they were building a combined police station. 
which would, if we built a combined fire and police safety complex, which absolutely makes more sense, it's going to be a tremendous amount of money. Now, is ultimately that the best thing to do? Absolutely. But we have 6.5 out there right now, and that 6.5 is to put our police in a suitable building and restructure town hall so that we can get our folks across and back from I feel into at least a building we own. I don't think there's many town halls in the state of Massachusetts that are in rental complexes. I might be wrong. But I think it makes sense to maybe move in that direction. And then obviously from what we heard tonight, and that wasn't even anything about the building, as we start to move forward, you know, uh, obviously uh, the fire department's gonna need some, some services and the benefits of um, studies like what we heard tonight. So for me, it's a 6.5 move forward, get your architectural uh, uh, engineering done, which I wish we had done in the beginning, and it should have been done in the beginning, and then we wouldn't be where we are now. But uh, it's a question of special town meeting, or annual town meeting. I think we're getting a little pin. Tracy, when is annual town, when is spring town meeting, annual town meeting? It would be I think in the town of Newberry, I could be wrong. Maybe if we had done it a whole lot earlier, there would be time before Christmas. There doesn't seem to be time before Christmas. I think in January, February, people have a tendency to go on vacations. There are school vacations. Some people go to Florida. I mean, I don't know if it becomes we strike when the iron's hot, but is the iron really cold or hot? <laughs> or do we wait till the annual town meeting and put together a consolidated, uh, uh, you know, something that we can think a lot about how we're going to do it? So, once again, I'm a little wishy-washy. Chuck's not here, so maybe it's not a vote that we should take tonight anyway. But we've articulated what we plan to say. It's more visual, it's out there, and maybe, you know, you see it on television, maybe we should be really ready to go by the next meeting, all of us, to make a choice. Well, I think we for Tuesday, what's that Tuesday? Yes. The next Tuesday, so be ready. Yeah. I think a special town meeting makes sense, and if we decide, which I don't, I may be the only person who's inclined to, to push for it, but pushing for the complete building at the next town meeting, when we have the fire, the police, and town hall at least squared away, it makes sense. Because if we lose that vote, there's no harm done. There's no loss to anyone at that point, provided we have at least a backup. No, when you're saying the complete bill of you. I mean, taking care of all three. So right now we have a partial fix for town hall and a new building for the police. I think what we should be doing is not sticking as closely to the idea of a combined police and fire and renovation of town hall, but raising the money that could solve all three problems and letting an engineer look at this lot which we now have, which is a fairly large lot, the three programs which we have laid out fully and let someone whose job it is to save money and do a good job say, the best way for you to do this is to do this here and that there and share these facilities or you won't share those facilities. So instead of sticking with the NBC plan, we could say, let's raise the money to solve the damn problems and not kick the can down the road that we've just had explained to us for the fire apparatus. It's a bad fiscal plan to keep kicking it down the road. So I think we should secure the ability to get the police into a new facility and to get our people back into a facility and then try and push one last time for the right solution rather than just saying people have said no because people have said no and people have said yes you know I went through all the votes the vote at the town meeting that passed the most strong was the one for solving all three problems you know, each ballot question has gotten closer and closer until we finally pass. So, to bring it forward costs us nothing. To 
to abandon it will cost everyone a lot. So, most likely, that'll be a pretty good uh, selection week next Tuesday. Uh, but next Tuesday, we're kind of deciding is it a special town meeting that we're looking at? Are we going to go to the annual town meeting? Yes. And maybe we can discuss more about what Damon is projecting and going back to basically the building envelope of the first one, which is a municipal complex. Funding to solve all the municipal problems. I don't like the labeling that's gone on because I feel like it has a bad taste for people at this point. I don't care what buildings get built, how they get built. If this gets renovated and the town hall gets torn down, and they're, you know, I don't care what happens. I want a good solution. Now, just for the sake of scoping, I'm going to take you up on that because in my initial context and discussion, it was hopefully getting town hall fixed and a police station built. And that's why I talked about Raleigh having two buildings, and then you go after building and what you have to do or whatever has to be done to this building. So you're saying the same thing. The actuality and reality is going to happen. Yeah, I mean, looking at we will save the town money if we raise all the money up front, hire one OPM, hire one architect, and solve all three problems. So, and, and I'll be seven. <laughs> well, that's why I'm saying I think it's imperative to take the past ballot initiative and make sure we get that through the town meeting. I think we can follow on that success with trying to solve all of our problems. I don't know if we could also, since we have to buy some fire apparatus, include that in the cost of the building and, uh, and use the same funding reduction that we have if we, you know, secure through the USDA the 2.9% loan. That would also save us some money, but I doubt it's possible. Whatever town meeting we choose, we're still going to have the 4.2 initiative no. out there for discussion at a town meeting. Only if they bring another ballot initiative. We don't have to bring that forward. That could still be on the floor, as I understand it, right? If they sign a petition for it. Only if it gets brought forward the petition. So it would take another whole petition. So that's a duty call. That's, okay, so that's news to me. Steve, I'll get you in a second. Um, the, clar the clarity, and I'm going to be quiet after this, the clarity and the truthfulness of the 6.5 does everything that you've talked about, or at least it's out there. Because the architectural engineer will be in place. And the idea of getting a police station and renovation of town hall is at least doable within that perspective. You could have engineering come back and say, it's pie in the sky, you can't do anything. Yes. So, anyway, the police are going to see. Can I ask you to clarify? Right. Maybe have a No, I think it's better to do it as a special town meeting. The more that I think about it, I think we have a special town meeting for the sole purpose of, of approving the spending for the ballot initiative that was approved. 6.5. 6.5. And then I think we should continue at the next annual town meeting to try and see if we can get the approval to solve, to raise the money to solve all three problems, at which point, should that pass the town meeting and the ballot, we would drop the previous one which we had passed. So if we can raise the money to solve the problem, or the other way to go at it is to just look at raising what we expect is the additional money we need for town hall renovations and fire. So there's two different ways to move forward once we have passed the funding for the, the current ballot initiative. One is to try and raise the total amount that we expect we need 
and then scrap the, the first proposal, and the other is to raise additional funds to go alongside what has already been approved at the ballot. So we have the funding bill at the end. That's one of the ways to go. I mean, I thought there were easier ways, and I spent a long time talking to Ginny to try and suss out and make sure that the ways forward that we we're trying to get these buildings built on would be legal because I was afraid that we would get through the voting process and find that we've made a mistake. And I, this has been enough of my nightmare that I really didn't want to do that. So I think what we have to kind of think about and we got to get Chuck to kind of watch this part of the sure, and also the fire part of the unit is very important. We do have our next solutions meeting next week. Tuesday. So we have to kind of decide at least what direction we're going to go in, meaning some of what Damon has said. I know I still have caught on 6.5, get it done, move forward. We have to decide what we want to do with the special meeting or the annual town meeting. So let's think about that and not beat it to death tonight. Tracy, did you have something? I was just going to say, if you, if you have any time between now and then, if we can sit down and we could just map out the proposals and I can run them by bond council and have them them, you know, give us a thumbs up or thumbs down or how it might work so we'd have that for Tuesday. Sure. Steve. I know from the time you vote on something at town meeting to an election is 90 days. Is that true conversely or not? It is not. It is not. We have. And the, the other question, Damon, if we, if we have a special town meeting and we vote for 6.5, are you suggesting we just sit on that until the annual town meeting and not go forward with the project? I think given how long these things take, we can start the process with the 6.5 and like I said, either raise more money or expand the scope of the project pretty easily. We will not be into uh, nuts and bolts design by the end of May. I mean, one thing is, when Steve thinks about this, and Barry thinks about this, and a few more people see this, it's going to seem like we're changing our mind again, or we're not staying to the pathways that we put in place. But one thing everyone should remember, you know, Damon could be thinking about these things and not really articulating them. So this board has always been transparent, crystal clear. So you will know, at least I hope by all of this, whether we have the intention of staying at 6.5 by next Tuesday, and whether we're going to have a special town meeting, or we're going to have an annual town meeting to accomplish that task, or whether we're going to explore some of the other ways of projecting. But one of the things you've got to remember, and I'm still at 6.5, get it done and move forward, and then tackle your other buildings as need be. But what Damon has said is almost the same gosh darn thing. When you get your town hall renovated, and you get your police station built, by the time that gets done three or four years from now, you're going to have some very serious concerns on what happens to this building. Going to be up against cost effectiveness. It's just the name of that tune. So there's really no round Robin Hood's bond or anything else. So let's be let's be in good shape by next by next Tuesday. Go ahead. And to your point, I just wanted to let you know that I've, um, I'm getting some quotes to commission a building envelope study on this facility, much like the one we did on the Newbury Elementary School, uh, the library. And that's now oh, just because we own it. You got well, it's because we own it. Yeah. So anyway, any other on the board? 
Any other questions from the audience? It's not a question. Go ahead, Bernie. But, uh, and I'm no spokesman, but the, the word is, and what, what the problem is, is that we don't like everything thrown together. We'd love to fix your town hall. I mean, goodness sakes, it's all torn apart now. It's got to be fixed. There's no, there's no question. And we want to build a nice police station, but we want to be the police station, then we get the town hall going. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. It's real easy to do. And, and you do it with everybody's blessings instead of a bunch of us going and having just 30 or 40 volts enough to stop you from doing anything. It just stalemates the whole thing. And, and you know, it, it, all you want is a town hall and a, and a police station right now. If you throw this in, forget it. You ain't going to get a thing. I guarantee that. You've seen that. So we, and when this needs fixing, we'll fix it. You, you know it's going to happen. It's like the DPW. That was a terrible thing. Oh, it had to be condemned and all of that. You know, and that's, that's riding hard on you people. It's riding real hard on you. Now, it may not be any of you people had anything to do with it, but it's riding on you. You got it, whether you wanted it or not. That was the biggest hoax that there ever has been in the town of Newbury, closing up the DPW. That, that was absolutely foolish. And it all could have been fixed with no problem at all, but you made a big deal out of it. You threatened all of us how we're not going to get the roads plowed, the chief of police ain't going to have a place to work, and it goes wrong against you. It goes real bad. And I like every one of you. And I'm, not, I'm just telling you what's, what's going around out there, and you see it at the meetings. And I get frustrated because I'd like to not go to these meetings. I'd like to sit home and watch TV or make, make it serve candy or <laughs> something like that. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go hard on you if it doesn't, doesn't go nice and plain and simple. That's, that's what we want. And the other thing is when we're getting a design together for a building, but uh, if you look at the Salisbury Police Station, now, whoever designed that could care less about the next generation of people coming along. That building is going to be the worst damn thing to maintain. I mean, it's got a, it's got a jog here and a jog there and a roof up here and a little thing over here. That's all a lot of money for the next generation when it comes to put a roof on it and do any maintenance. And, and you don't need a building to look stupid like that. So, but anyhow. No. I, I got to calm down and get all wound up. Hell, I agree. Thank you for that, sharing that with us. That being said, we don't disagree with some of what you said. We're not that far off of the same task. Right, we that's, that's just, the encouraging thing. We just believe that it's a real bad idea to be building a police station and not be working on a town hall at the same time. And See, that's I, just okay. I that's think just, it costs a lot of money to just do that. Just the difference. We'll have one OPM, just the difference, and it's okay. We'll see what happens at town meeting. And I think respectfully, too, that the most important thing coming out of all of this is the fact that everyone has an awareness of all of the issues we're facing, that we're putting together a very solid capital plan, whether or not we're able to address them all at once or over the next five years or the next 10 years, that's going to be up to the residents to make those decisions. Yep. But everyone here wants all of the residents to be aware of what you are facing and, and what condition your buildings are in. And I, I wasn't here during the time that the DPW was condemned, but I can assure you that nobody here will sit by idly while these buildings are condemned. I, I just want to say, Bernie, my move to 6.5 and just police and town hall res renovation had a lot to do with talking to folks that are thinking like you're thinking. Yeah. yeah. And, and That's why it's so important that we all meet in the middle because we can say if I can buy any things. You, but the whole spiel was too much for a lot of people to stop. Well, so, you're talking to someone like when I said, hey, how about using the old school for a police station? Oh, no, no, oh, no, oh, no. I saved buildings like that. I built buildings like that, so I knew it was a bunch of crap when it when it was said. And now, if you look at it, cost you six a million bucks to have one of them uh, places over there. Let me tell you something. 
I can't not take credit because I was around during the the uh, school stupid. We should have kept it. Yeah, but that's the and, 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 hey, and the honest but, but the honest person that's around. Either, that's the other hand of it. So, any other questions? Very thanks. Let's move forward. Old business, any? Citizens concerned. Don't say anything. <laughs> uh, is there any correspondence that I missed? Uh, review of meeting minutes. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry, John. And let me see if I can read. Hey, John, you've been sitting here all night. Yeah, John, this is your chance. Sorry. I'll tell you though, it's no, not, I love for, the bar. It's not the for a great reason because Christine Wilkerson has benefited this town in so many ways. She's benefited the sporting community in more ways than you can imagine. And it's been a great pleasure for me to work with her on many different things. But to all the members of the New Week Planning Board and fellow members of the New Week Board to Boston Rail Committee, I'm writing this correspondence to let you know that I resign from my position for the board of the Boston Rail Trail, the reasons for my resignation are a personal nature, and I can only invoke the time needed to serve on the committee. Please consider this my committee resignation letter. John has worked well with her. I was on the committee for a little while. John, you'd like to speak a little bit? Well, Martha asked me to, but I'm certainly uh, glad to. Uh, Christine was uh, with incredible energy. She's fun to work with. She she got things done. She just jumped into things with the idea that. Uh, let's go and do it. Let's get something done. She put together the um, um, yard sale as our first fundraiser, um, which got us um, a lot more than anyone had expected in money. She helped with the um, uh, write the grant for institution for savings, which got us five thousand um, dollars. She would talk with people who lived. Um, near the trail where people were interested in knowing about the trail, whether they were in favor or not, she would talk with them and uh, hear their concerns, tell them what the plans were. Uh, she would work on taking photographs of the trail. She did some great photograph. Um, I said energy, I gotta say energy again. She had incredible energy. Um, sensitivity to the environment, especially when working with people from Parker River clean water and looking at the sensitive nature of the trail along the river and coming up with some really clever alternative uh, paving solutions that we're still trying to figure out if we can get the state to go with, but um, hopefully someday. And uh, she is just uh, a great person to work with and uh, we'll miss her on the committee. And uh, I mirror everything that John has said for all the reasons that I spoke about before. And John, thank you very much. Christine always did these things with great energy. And it was funny, she always kind of had a thought for what the result might be. So um, she kind of had the vision to look ahead. So we should write a letter, I think, in thanking her. Can I have a motion? Uh, motion to write a letter of thanks to Wilkins, Wilkins. Wilkins. For her time for her time. Any discussion? Good idea. Thanks. Sir. Uh, everyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, John. Um, review of meeting minutes. And passing of uh, the, the minutes of November 15, 2016. Do I have a motion? You weren't here. Yeah. Motion to approve. You were here, yeah. Uh, so, all right, we can put that in the next two <laughs> How's that? Pretty good. I looked at the red, the red who was there. So I thought we should move there. All right, motion to sign warrants. So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any updates? Anyone? Um, I've been back and talking to Brian Fogarty about trying to make sure that uh, you know, parents and children can attend town meetings sort of got lost in the grand opening and planning for the stadium. So we've started up that discussion again. Uh, he's encouraged me to reach out to the selectmen of Salisbury and Rowley, and I wanted to discuss with you guys if we should do that on an individual level or write them a letter. Well, I'm going to a district communication meeting. I think it's
Is that sort of the district communication is meeting? Yeah, it's next th Thursday night at 15. Can we do a couple of we have 13, we have one selected meeting. 15, yeah. I have a, a 6.30, I have a district communication meeting, that's right. So, anything else you can bring up, we have to reach out, that would be fun to do. I would love if you could discuss with them the idea of... Um, Anthony, would you? Yeah. Yeah, we'll just attend. What time is it? 6.30, that's right. So we took care of that for you. Yep. Right. So he's still on board with trying to make, you know, make town meetings more accessible and, and having the schools help with that. So um, we just have to move that forward. And have some design and how they can be done. So, yep. Executive session? None. Motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.